Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in the Excel Center in London where we're covering the DSCI trade show, world's leading air, land, sea, space, cyber, and security trade show where they've also got a whole bunch of very cool robots. Our coverage here is in partnership with DSCI and Clarion Events and we've got with us Adrian Andrasek who is uh, the person all things robotic here at Harris. Adrian, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And a special shout out to Mick, one of the best dressed guys in this show, who's actually operating this little baby. Can I get my microphone back, Mick? Mick, thanks so much, I appreciate that. Wow, you guys didn't even bust it up. That's really great. So, Adrian, yes. talk to us a little bit. I mean, Harris is a uh, known for communication as a communications company, right. battlefield comms, digital networks, the whole nine yards, but not necessarily the first thing of when you think of uh, robotics. So talk to us a little bit about this handsome little vehicle. Right, so this is the T7 robot. It was actually specifically designed for IED defeat. So an IED is an improvised explosive device. And unfortunately, that is a problem worldwide in over 75 countries. So what we've done is developed this amazing technology, life-saving technology, to get it in the hands of the EOD technicians so they can send the robot downrange, put the robot in harm's way so they do not have to be in harm's way. So talk to us about, you know, obviously the robotic field is something very exciting. A lot of the folks here have them. There are some ARM versions of them. There are some sensor platform versions of them. iRobot, of course, everybody remembers the PackBot, which was one of the most uh, proliferated. You know, when the Army said there's tens of thousands of robots, the PackBots make up a large chunk of that. But talk to us about the capabilities that this particular system brings in this very competitive space. Absolutely. So there are two things really that set our system apart from our other competitors. So the first is its human-like capability. It's very dexterous and it actually moves the way the user moves. So if they move their hand up, the robot actually moves the arm up. The second piece of that is there are sensors in the fingers that actually provide haptic feedback to the user. So when the robot makes contact with something in its environment, the user actually feels it in their hand. So the user can actually make the robot move the way they're moving and they feel what the robot feels. And, and that was also one of the reasons why you didn't crush this very nice Electra Voice German microphone. Um, so talk to us a little bit about that because, you know, there's been uh, discussion for many years that haptics was going to change the world. iPhone used that in, in terms of the replacing of the button. But even before that, the, the Apple Watch has, I'm an Apple Watch wearer, and haptics are a key part of it where it gives you a tap on the wrist. Talk to us about how haptics are going to change, how we interface, especially with, with robots and, and other autonomous systems, even transglobally, you'll be able to get a lot of tactile feel. And we're bringing you coverage literally as they close the doors here uh, on this Thursday at the show. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay, sure. So certainly what you would like to do with the robot is get it as far away from the user as possible, keep the user away from whatever the threat is. So this can actually go up to a kilometer away so the user can't see what the robot is doing. So they have nine camera views that they can use to select from, but it's still a 2D selection that they're looking at. So the robot really gives them that extra sensory spatial awareness so that they know when they're making contact with something. So that's what really gives them that extra feel in the environment and helps them perform whatever activity with a lot of dexterity and precision. And that's really the feedback, that haptic feedback tied with those camera views. And, and it's uh, remarkably warm and cuddly for a... Uh, for, <laughs> for, uh, uh, it is, it is, it's very sweet. Um, we look forward to it growing up into Gigantor. Uh, but, but tell us a little bit about what's next in robotics. You're a professional in this field. You know, where are we going to be? I mean, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were absolutely critical in driving the state of the art of autonomy, commercial applications or driving artificial intelligence. But where is the nexus of these two systems going to take us even five years from now, whether in form, fit, and function of how these robots are going to operate or the kind of networks in which they're going to operate? So certainly I do think you, you've touched on one thing is I think there is maybe a lot of networking, a lot of pairing of systems. So like a ground vehicle with an airborne vehicle can work in tandem. Um, there's also a possibility of some additional autonomy. So uh, T7 has a lot of nice preset positions, but maybe doing a little extra autonomy to take some of the effort off of the user preset positions like it can do a split or other sort of dance moves and things like that? <laughs> I wish it was that cool. <laughs> so uh, this is actually one of the presets. It's basically our deploy position. Um, there's another one that's basically uh, where you had it with the microphone in it. So that's another forward position, a high position for looking at something that might be on a shelf. Um, there's an under vehicle position and it just prevents the user from having to manually put the arm in that, that pose, but it's something that they would commonly use. And it's just something that makes, makes life a little bit easier. 
Absolutely, yes. And so everything about the system is electric or are you using hydraulics as well? <laughs> it is actually fully electric, so we run off a battery system. And about how much uh, range, persistence, operating time do you get? And I know that it matters on how, you know, the big muscle movements and drive, drive motors and things like that. But generally, what sort of mission profile are you guys looking at? So we can go up to a, a kilometer away, and the system has about 10 hours of runtime with a fairly heavy use for our mission. And right now at the show, we can run off a series of batteries for the entire show. Wow. And, and about how fast is the recharge time? Because, you know, soldiers always want to make sure that they get the system back in battery, if you will. How long for you to charge whatever kind of preventative maintenance you have to do to keep the system running? Right, so fortunately the system does have some regenerative capability, but it really depends on the battery you choose. So we use a standard off-the-shelf BB2590. Those usually recharge within a few hours, but again, it would depend on the user, whatever they select to use in the system. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Mick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And look forward to following you guys uh, in the future, because this is definitely one of the cooler interviews we've done here. Thanks very much. Thank you.